Okay, Janice, I'm thinking we're connected in live because I see the picture and you didn't tell me go. So I am going to go and uh, welcome everyone again. We have a very fun week for you. This is Martial Arts Week. We are featuring three different martial arts studios this week that will give us information on three different types of martial arts. We are um, so excited to see you guys again. It's been a while. Remember that if you'd like to go ahead and uh, get some attendance credit for a scholarship, make sure that you go to the library's website, hit the events button, and there will be a registration form. I would like to introduce you now to um, Sifu Errol Henderson. He is well known with us at the library. He has done many events with us. Um, he is the owner of um, Zen Marshall of Colleen. And, right? <laughs> I said that right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and um, he is going to talk today all about Kung Fu. If you have any questions, make sure you put them in the Facebook comments and um, he'll go ahead and be able to answer that. So, Sifu Henderson, take it away. Thank you very much, Ms. Osa. I appreciate it. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you guys here today. So, today we're going to be talking about Kung Fu, like Ms. Osa said. Uh, I've done many events with uh, CTC just as an outside um, person that comes in and talks about Tai Chi, Qigong, martial arts in general. Uh, we've done many events with them and I enjoy every one of them. Now, what we're going to do today, here's the outline. So um, I want to talk about what Kung Fu is and where it came from, talk about some of the concepts that we teach here at the school. And then at the end, I want to give you guys a bonus, not something to show off my capabilities or abilities, but something more that I can give to you guys that will allow you to be prepared to do physical activity each and every day and loosen up some of the major joints of the body, get the blood pumping a little bit and get you loosened up so you're prepared for activities, all right? So um, first things first, if you aren't familiar with myself, which I don't know why you would be unless you've been to one of the other events, my name is Earl Henderson. My title is Sifu, which just kind of means like master or mentor. Uh, the two characters actually mean teacher and father. And together, it's, it's like a mentor or a master. It's something that's leading you through something, okay? Um, I've been doing this for 16 years. I got my black belt. I've been teaching ever since. I've also got medical Qigong certifications and uh, what we call here at the school SWAT team certifications, which... For the uninitiated, just means my teacher tortures me more than anybody else. That's it, right? <laughs> so, um, with that said, uh, I like it. I've been doing this. I've always wanted to do it since I was a child, and I never got the opportunity at that point. When I became an adult, I got the opportunity, and they couldn't get rid of me. So, um, I've been here ever since, and I don't imagine myself doing anything else. Uh, this has definitely been something that has challenged me. Uh, to no end and continues to challenge me and help me grow not only as a person but also as a father, as a teacher, and as a martial artist. Uh, so I definitely uh, won't see myself doing anything, uh, anything more anytime soon, right? So other than that, that's me. Um, the title Sifu, uh, I, I take it seriously. However, I also know within the vast world of martial arts and martial artists, that titles don't mean much. You have a bunch of talented martial artists out there that don't have titles. They don't think about titles. This is something that we use uh, that comes from one of the philosophical um, ideas that Kung Fu was born out of, and that was Confucianism. And it's giving like rank and title to how, uh, how you should treat certain people or the ranking system and the morality that it was incorporated into martial artists uh, and martial arts in general as Confucianism came about. Uh, another deeper part of that or an older part of that because Chinese martial arts has a deep rooted history. It's well over 2000 years old, right? So one of the other parts of that would be Zen Buddhism and also Taoism, right? So these three, these three principles or these three ideas kind of uh, led the way to making martial arts or Chinese martial arts what it is today. So the Taoist philosophy is more adhering to nature, 
the Buddhist philosophy is more adhering to uh, peace and serenity and the understanding that life is suffering, right? That you're going to uh, have some sort of suffering and then the way to ascend that suffering is to gain enlightenment. And enlightenment is not, you know, a lot of people put like um, very esoteric meaning to that. And there is some of that, but the idea of enlightenment is more of your awareness, right? The more you become aware, the more you can gain knowledge and understanding of that knowledge, the more you can ascend suffering that comes from lack of that knowledge, right? But we also understand within that principle, the more knowledge you get, the more suffering you're gonna understand as well, because then you see it, you're aware of it, right? So it doesn't escape you, right? There's no ignorance involved in that, right? So those are kind of like the three modalities that, that built up Chinese martial arts into what it is. Now, what people, I'll, I'll talk about what Kung Fu is in another term, like what people usually call Kung Fu is a generalization. We it, over here in the West have kind of understood Kung Fu to be Chinese martial arts, and that's not true. The term Kung Fu is like a, a skill obtained through hard work over time and effort would be the meaning of Kung Fu. So that's why if you've watched the movie Karate Kid, you, you hear uh, Jackie Chan say, you can have Kung Fu in anything. You can be a cook and have Kung Fu. You can be a painter and have Kung Fu. You can be a janitor and have Kung Fu, right? You can have a skill obtained through hard work over time. So the term Kung Fu is just a pointer to what we call martial arts. The actual term would be Wushu, right? Martial arts or self-defense, right? So when you're talking about Chinese martial arts, it's all Wushu. Now, some of us more traditional martial artists like to make a separation because there's contemporary wushu and then there's uh there's traditional wushu so traditional martial artists go through the the forms and the self-defense aspect the whole nine yards whereas contemporary wushu a lot of it nowadays is a sport meant to dis display the athleticism of what martial arts could be right and typically they're not doing a lot of that the technical applications to it to make it more of a practical self-defense art right? Which there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, they made it a sport like that so they can compete in the Olympics and do things like that. So it has its place, right? But there is a separation in the understanding of what uh, contemporary or modern wushu is versus traditional wushu, which is what Jet Li did, right? That's how he became famous in the 1970s when they did what's calling back, uh, pulling back the Iron Curtain, right? So China introducing itself to the world. He was part of that team of martial artists that went out and displayed kind of some of the things that Chinese, the Chinese people did, right? Okay, so another part of what Kung Fu is, um, it is, well, it's not used in the way it used to be used, right? So it used to be, you know, this was used in actual battle. Now, we're not defending the village with swords and spears, right? Not yet, right? <laughs> I don't know, it may come to that, I don't know, right? But that's not necessary today. So it's proven itself to be a modern day advantage to achieve success and become a leader throughout every area of, of your life, as well as the practical self-defense that comes with it. Okay. So um, what else? The bow. The bow is an exchange of courtesy. Like when you meet somebody for the first time and you shake their hand. So we see this in almost all martial arts. We see this in dignitaries from other countries. When we meet each other, it's more of a bow. And a lot of times this is considered more respectful than a handshake, right? So it is also used as like when we're partnering up in, in class, it's used as our promise to one another. We're promised to be careful and considerate of one another. We promise not to hurt the other person. And that's how we make martial arts safe for one another. If I think of your safety above my own and you do the same, then we're not going to be breaking our partners. You break too many partners. Nobody's going to want to train with you. So you train hard, but you want to make sure that you also stay mindful of the other person's safety, right? Now, it's also a reminder to always do our best. So when we bow coming in the academy and we bow when we leave the academy, that's our reminder. While I'm here, I'm going to do my best. Whatever I was thinking about before I got here, I want to leave that outside and I want to start one of the best parts of my day. And that's me working on myself, making myself better. And then when we leave, it's always goodbye, sir, goodbye, ma'am, when we bow reminding ourselves that we're future black belts. We're always future black belts, even if you got your black belt. It's like, how do I continue to improve myself? So I want to remind myself, as a future black belt, I need to act with respect, discipline, no matter where I go or whom I'm with, right? Now, 
within Kung Fu, especially over here, there's three different ways I teach a martial arts student to demonstrate respect within this environment. That's eye contact. So we look at people that we're speaking with in the eyes. It shows that what you and the other person have to say is important. Then there's also, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, no, sir, no, ma'am. So it's a way for us to show respect to one another. And that way there's no misunderstanding about a respectful relationship that we have. And then the other part of it is following the rules. Following the rules is important. Now, following the rules, it presents you a structure, right? And the only way you don't follow the rules is when it, it begins to make you unsafe, right? So you understand the rules for what they are is developing you a structure so that you stay safe and you can be protected and uh, things can move efficiently is another reason, right? But when that becomes unsafe for you, it may be time for you maybe to break a rule or bend a rule so that you can stay safe, right? So this is how I explain it to the kids. Right? This way they don't find themselves in a situation. Well, I'm not supposed to leave the mat, so I'm going to use the bathroom by myself. Right? No, there's a, there's a reason. There's things that we do. You know, raise your hand. Let me know. If I don't see you, go. Right? So I'm watching everybody, but I might in turn helping a student, and this other student has to go to the bathroom. If it's an emergency, go. Like, break the rule of staying on the mat so that you can get to the bathroom and not have an accident and be embarrassed. Right? So... Following the rules is a way to be successful, not just here in the academy, of course, but everywhere that you go, right? So for kids, I explain this to them this way. Like if you're at home, mom and dad ask you to do something, you do it the first time that they ask you. No hesitation. It means right away. So it's always, if they call you, it's yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And then I need you to go do this. I need you to go do that. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And then we go get that done, right? This is playing your role as um, a son or a daughter and showing appreciation for what your parents do for you, right? So it's it's more of like, okay, we all play our part. How do I play my part as the child? How do I see my importance in the family? Well, by you doing this, you're making it easier not only for yourself, but you're also making it easier for your parents too. They don't have to get frustrated by telling you the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And then you don't get frustrated because you get in trouble for not doing the thing that you know you were supposed to. Right. And we even run into this as adults, not being committed and procrastinating on things. It was like, I know there's something I'm supposed to do. And then I put it off and I put it off. No, it's it's more of like if you told yourself you're going to do something, you're telling yourself, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And then we go get it done. Right. And that way we don't put things off and we make our own life easier. and We don't cause our own suffering. And that's going to be important. Right. Um, because that's from that Buddhism aspect. That's what causes our own suffering, us not adhering to the things that we know are supposed to be done or we know we're supposed to be do, doing or some sense of morality that we're, we think we should follow from our point of view of values, right? So next part. Um, oh, I forgot to mention in the beginning, anytime you guys have questions, please ask them. Um, so I like more of a free flowing environment. I know I talk a lot, but you know, I'm, just, I'm trying to follow this this idea that I have in my head that this this should go. But if you guys have any questions that you might think of during it, please feel free to ask. I don't mind at all. So moving into uh, the next part that I teach everybody about Kung Fu, it's a lot about self-control, right? So when we're dealing with self-control when it comes to Kung Fu, um, for us adults, it's a lot about uh, emotional responses, right? Controlling ourselves, usually a lack of self-control happens during emotional upset, right? We may get uh, angry, fearful, worried, right, sad. We go through these different emotions. And the first part of you that's affected by emotions is not just the chemicals that are, that are uh, uh, produced from the brain, but also your breathing, right? So the breathing, most people breathe very shallowly, right? They're using the top two parts of their lungs and that's about it. And they, they don't breathe deep enough uh, to get oxygen into the body. And then when you start going through an emotion, the breathing speeds up, it becomes more shallow. And this actually depletes the body of oxygen. The brain is a very greedy thing. It takes up a lot of your nutrients and energy. So depriving it of oxygen will help you to make those stupid decisions that happen when you guys, when we're all going through emotional upset, right? So a big thing that I teach students to do is deep qigong breathing. So deep qigong breathing, so, so the terminology doesn't, you know, go over your head or be something that it's, it's too complicated. Basically what it means is lower abdominal breathing, 
right? So if you watch a baby breathe, right? It breathes from the lower abdomen. So we lose that because the body is very adaptable, very efficient. And when it finds out, oh, we're, we're, not, we're not using that capacity anymore, it'll deplete your ability to use whatever capacity that, you're, that you used to have to use. Anybody 33 and older, you understand this from a movement perspective. It's just like, oh, I don't move like I used to. Well, that's only because you stopped moving like you used to, barring some sort of accident or trauma that happened, right? So um, when we're doing the breathing, I teach deep qigong breathing. What I have people do is lay their hands on their lower abdomen, about two inches below the navel. And all you got to do is sit up straight, make sure your head is lifted and your tailbone is tucked. Breathe in and try and expand the lower abdomen, like the pelvic girdle area, not just your belly, right? And then when you exhale, you contract and squeeze all the air that you can out. And like take four to five seconds to do this. So it's four to five seconds breathing in, and then it's four to five seconds breathing out, right? And when we do this, this helps oxygenate the body, but it also does this. It creates space between stimulus and response. Whatever is provoking the emotion and your reaction to what happened with that emotion, right? So that's going to be very important. Now, the trick to this is, and this is why everybody promotes meditation, you have to, pre you have to practice creating this space, right? If you don't practice creating this space, you may know you want to get there, but you won't have the ability to get there when you need it, right? So meditation helps you to sit there, kind of get in the zone and just focus on the breath, nothing else. So you practice creating that space, that meditative space that gives you time to think and make a decision so that when you're going through emotional upset, taking those deep breaths kind of takes you back into that zone so you create that space for yourself, right? So it's a little mental trick that you use to help create that space so you're not over or underreacting to life's challenges because you're going to run into it, right? If we understand it from that Buddhist perspective, like we were talking about before, or even from the Taoist perspective of understand cyclical nature, like life is going to be ups and downs. Life is not going to be one constant thing, except for at one point when you die. That's it. It's all, it's all even at that point, right? We're in no hurry, right? So take your time and just appreciate the ups and downs just as much as, appreciate the downs as much as you appreciate the, the top point of your life, right? Usually the low parts is when we learn the most. Right. The top parts is when we're enjoying everything the most, but it's only because we learned a lesson where and we were able to improve. Right. So take that and strive and don't get so beat up when things are at their low points. These are opportunities and they're not just points that are low. Sometimes it's just sadness. So what can I learn out of this sadness? What can I learn out of this attachment that I lost? Right. So going through that and just having a better understanding of it will help you through it a lot of times versus just going through the emotional grief of something like trying to understand it better will help you just get more clarification on it, right which usually helps you through it okay so uh that's part of the self-control right the other part of the self-control is controlling the body right a lot of times we don't have control of our own bodies is because we don't take time to train our body to do the things that we want and that's a difficult thing, right? So it's like going to the gym or doing martial arts every day or, well, I say every day. I'm usually a five day a week guy right about now, right? So there used to be a time where I was six, seven days a week. You know, I'm 40 now. So I'm just like, five days is good. You know, I train, <laughs> I train about two times a day and, and I leave it at that five days a week. Now I still get up and stay active on the weekend. So it's not like I just sit in front of the TV all weekend, you know, I do still stay active and get up and move around and things like that. I'm just not as active, right? And that's only because I want to keep my ability to move and function. I don't want that to go away. So it's important to me that I keep that. So when my grandkids are around, I can run around and play with them. And it was like, look at grandpa, you can't do this yet, right? <laughs> so it's that sort of thing, you know, building upon being able to play with them and give them something also to look up to, right? So um, the self, uh, excuse me, self-control of not only your mind and your emotions, and it's not really about controlling the emotions. It's more about understanding and being able to deal with the emotions and, and ride the wave, basically, right? And then controlling the body is about making your body do the things that you want it to do. Now, when I say that, I don't, and I, I make this evident to my students, rest is part of training your body. 
So I'm not saying you got to train all day, every day, no breaks, no complaining. No, no, it's it's hard. That's why it's called hard work, right? So it's like one of the other translations, come hard, food, work, hard work, right? But that's just like a, a very simplified version of the term. Like I said, it's, a, a, it's an achievement that, that's gained through hard work, right? So um, I guess the next part would be the self-defense aspect, right? Now, a lot of your self-defense comes from your physical and mental awareness, right? Not only of yourself, not only of other people in their anatomy, but also your surroundings, right? These are going to be three important aspects when it comes to self-defense. So you got to be aware of where you're at. So whenever I do like um, self-defense uh, seminars and things of that nature, the first thing I'm dealing with is a person's awareness of their surroundings, right? Am I aware of what's around me? Am I aware of where I'm at? Am I aware of the situation that I'm in? How well do I pay attention to the people around me? what the vibe is in the room, like, like where's, where's the temperature in the room and not like the Fahrenheit temperature. I'm talking about like the, the attitudes and behaviors of the people that are around me. Where's that at? Like, is this, is this a tense environment, right? Is this a, an environment that is like free flowing, right? Everybody's just, they're, they're doing their own thing, right? Or is this an environment that's very controlled? So I have to understand each step that I make to make sure that I'm making the right steps, right? I need to understand the environment that I'm in. That's number one. Number two is understanding that, and not from a paranoid perspective, but if something were to happen, how do I get out of this, this room, this environment? How do I get to a place that's safer for me, right? Where I can kind of regroup and move from there, right? So these are going to be important aspects when it comes to being aware of self-defense training. Right now, the next part I would say to that would be uh, what you use for your self defense and your then your mind or I guess mindset would be first your mindset for self defense and then what you use for self defense. So the idea is that if I am in a situation right, it's better for me to talk my way out of it than it is for me to strike anybody. It, and it's better for me to strike somebody than it is for me to break something on them. It's better for me to break something on them than it is for me to kill them or take their life. Right. So I, I have to go through this process, understand the seriousness of this situation and make a determination off of these factors, right? Because uh, again, from the Buddhist and the Taoist philosophy uh, and the Confucian philosophy, all of these together, we understand all life is precious. That person is somebody's family member, just like you're somebody's family member. Just because you don't like them or their beliefs or their views or how they look, whatever the case may be, that doesn't make them any less important than you. So we understand, okay, if they're, if they're just as important as me, I'm going to take this into consideration, even though they're not making the best decisions for themselves or for me right now. So I got to make sure that I make that determination, right? So then it would be uh, from the mental perspective, giving yourself permission to protect yourself to the highest degree, right? If I have to go to the darkest place that I have inside me and actually take somebody's life to save my own, do I give myself permission to do that, right? Can I take that limiter off to get to that point, right? And a lot of people haven't been put in a situation that actually they have to do this. And this is not an easy part. You think you can just turn on the switch and uh, it doesn't always work that way, right? And sometimes the instincts will take over and you'll be able to do what you need to do to stay safe. And that is the biggest point. Am I able to give myself permission to do what it takes to stay safe, get home safe, right? And that's what you got to go through. If the situation arrives, what, what am I willing to do to go home safe? What am I willing to do to go home to my family? And don't just give a simple answer, like actually go through the meditation or the thought process of going through that. So that way, when you have to do it, it's not your first time thinking about it, right? You know what you're going to be willing to do. Right. So that mindset training is also going to be a very important part, like getting kids right a lot of times to even strike one another. Right. Even with gear on, like they're so shy. They know they fell down. They've been hit. They've gone through all kinds of stuff and they're really durable. But when it comes to like causing that on somebody else, a lot of times in their mind, they have to get over that. So you have to kind of it's OK. Like it's OK. You have to give them that permission to do that. And little boys with girls, they do the same thing. Like, 
And it, I don't even think it's something that they're taught. I think it's something that they naturally do or they hear it. And they, of course, we, we have social standards that we usually adhere to and they catch on to that at an early age. So it's just like, no, I don't want to hit her. And I'm like, no, you have to, because that's going to train her on what to do in a situation where somebody like yourself or somebody like yourself may not care about her like you care about her, even though that's just your friend, right? So it's going through scenarios of training the mind and training children. <laughs> they cut the lights off on you, Ms. Oja. <laughs> So going through training the mindset to give yourself permission to actually go through a process, right? So go through that meditation, find out what you're willing to do so that when you do have the physical tools, you're able to use them. Because here's what you don't want to do. You learn all the physical stuff and it becomes exercise because when it comes time to use it, you're too worried to use it. You're too scared to use it. And then you don't use it, right? So that, that mindset has to be trained uh, to, to move forward, to be able to use it in the proper way to the proper extent. Right. Okay. So then we come to like mental training within the martial arts Now, mental training, a lot in the martial arts, I can boil it down to one word, concentration, right? When you're thinking about concentration, it's not just the concentration of like your physical techniques. Right. I have to concentrate my body to be able to get it to do the thing that I want it to do. But I also have to concentrate my mind. I have to concentrate my breath. I have to concentrate the spirit inside of me. Right. To all link up to where it will work together so that I can get whatever it is accomplished. Now, you use this in your own training in your schoolwork. Right. So if I have training in my schoolwork and I want to sit and concentrate. Right. Not only do I have to have good posture or good sitting or whatever, I, I need to be comfortable, right? But I also need to be focused mentally. All right, what is my objective? If I'm going to sit down here and I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes to an hour and I'm going to spend my life doing this, what do I want to get out of it? Once I have that, then I can kind of stay on track because I know as I go through it, I know where I'm going. I don't want to just sit down to study and I don't have an objective in my study. Well, I got study. Or you're not going to get very effective study because your mind won't be focused in on what the goal and the objective of studying is doing. And it can't be something as big as, well, I want to get good grades, right? Well, most people do, right? And unless they don't, I understand that too, right? But most people that, that even make the attempt to study want to have good grades. So like, what is my objective in this moment, in this hour that I'm going to spend doing the study? What do I want to understand when I walk away from this? What do I want to have down when I want to walk away from this? And in doing that, we're able to concentrate our efforts so we can get the most out of the time that we spend doing something, right? So it's the same thing with your body. If I'm going to move my body, what is the best way to move my body to achieve a certain goal? I have to know what the goal is. I have to know what the outcome is. And then I have to focus on training my body to get that best outcome, right? So whether it's weightlifting, whether it's calisthenics, aerobics, yoga, any other martial art that you're going to do, you have to have a goal and an outcome of what you're going to accomplish in that session. What am I working on? What am I trying to achieve here today? That way, you are going to be way more laser sharp when it comes to what you're doing in that time frame. Okay. Um, the last part would be like the philosophical training. And we talked about this a little bit when we broke it up into the philosophical, uh, or excuse me, when we broke it up to like the three, the, uh, the three thought processes or philosophies that go into making up Chinese martial arts, which is the Buddhism, the Taoism, and also the Confucianism, right? So, but it's also what we teach here from a smaller and a broad, uh, I say smaller, uh, I would say a more obtuse perspective, right, would be... Um, Understanding the life skills that we teach and understanding the student oath, like this would be the beginning, right, to, to understanding like how, what the philosophy is going to be. And then we can branch out from there where these thought process, processes came from, right? So when it comes to our school, the, the life skills have to do with five elements, which comes from a Taoist perspective. So it's going to be like a focused mind, a courageous heart, persistent action, balanced emotions, and a creative spirit, right? understanding all of these as a perspective and how I apply them, not just here, but in every aspect of my life is going to be kind of a determining factor of how our students develop and are able to process information to get to where they want to go, 
right? I want to have a focused mind. So if I'm going to do something, I want to focus my energy on it, right? I got to have a courageous heart. I can't let fear stop me, right? So I show strength in the face of fear. So whenever I'm scared or nervous about something, that's okay. You don't let it stop you from moving forward. You still move forward and you give it your best effort. You learn through the process, right? Persistent action. I don't quit until I achieve my goal. There are too many times where we quit just shy of reaching the goal. And it's just like, nope, I may have to adjust my approach, but the idea is I've got a goal that I got to get to. I want to make sure I give it every effort to make it to that goal. Like there's not going to be a reason that I don't reach this goal. I'm not going to make any excuses. I'm not going to procrastinate. I'm going to make sure that I'm persistently acting towards achieving something. Right. And then there's balanced emotions. I understand that I'm going to experience every spectrum of emotion. I, you don't escape it, right? And you don't want to. You don't want to shut yourself off. You want to experience things more fully, right? And the more fully you experience things, the more you enjoy life, the more you're engaged in the life and not trying to avoid certain feelings, right? Now, what we want, don't want to do is overreact to those feelings, right? And that's what gives us balance. We want to experience them. We want to go through the process, but we don't want to overact when they happen, right? And then we just take it too far, right? Joy taken too far leads to uh, chaos, right? You think about a child that gets really excited and then they're all over the place. Now they're breaking all the rules and they don't know how to, and then they get in trouble, right? No, it's too far, right? Or sadness. I get so sad that I get depressed and now I'm stuck in a rut that I have to work myself out of. Right. So it's not over underreacting. And I know depression is not something that that can be controlled all the time. So uh, not to overgeneralize that. Right. But just giving you like a base perspective on overreacting to some of the emotions that we go through. Right. So balanced emotions is going to be about making sure one that I don't overreact to what's happening. But two, I don't engage in a lot of the negativity. Right. I want to stay focused on thinking more along the lines of what I want versus what I don't want, right? Because whatever you focus on is going to expand, right? So I'm fo if I'm focusing on all the things that I don't want to have happen, guess what I'm going to find more of? More of the things that I don't want to have happen because that's the thing that I'm focused on, right? Here's a good example of it. it um, and I forget the term or the part of the brain that does, does this. Uh, oh, regulation. Right. So have you ever just been introduced to something or here's another one, bought a new car. You didn't see the car all the time, but now that you bought the new car, you see them everywhere. Right. Your attention has been brought to something. Now your brain recognizes it. more, Right. So that's what happens when you focus on a certain thing, a particular activation activates. Right. And then now you see it more often. Now you see evidence of it more often. Now you see improvement proof of showing up in places that you didn't see it before. And you're like self-fulfilling a prophecy that didn't have to exist. So when I say, when we think about balanced emotions, where we're focusing on more of the things that we want versus the things that we don't want is because we want to be activated towards the things that we're working for. So we stay focused and concentrated or moving in that direction versus getting sidelined, sidetracked or held back by the things that we don't want, right? They're going to happen regardless. Just think of them as hurdles in your on your way to get to where it is where you're going but that thinking about what we want is where we're going hurdles are going to come we just got to get over it right so number next uh i would say would be uh so that's the life skills the student oath so in the student oath there's like two sides to this right it's learning and it's respect right so we we learn kindness we learn loyalty or friendship and we learn hard work Right. Those are the things that we're working to learn more about each and every time that we come to class, wherever we go. These are the philosophies that we take with us. And then it's respect. Right. We respect the ancestors. Right. So respecting the ancestors is more akin to like. Having an appreciation for the things that people have done before you to allow you to have the things that you have now. Right. And then respecting your teachers. Your teachers are giving up their time, energy, effort. They've acquired a certain knowledge and ability to be able to disseminate information to you. So having a respect for your teachers and the effort that they put in to give you more information and knowledge and develop your mind and your abilities, whether it be physically or mentally or spiritually, right? So you respect your teachers. And then you respect 
And so for here, it's respect the school and its teaching or what it teaches, right? So you're respecting the place that you're in, the philosophy of that place, and you're trying to adhere to that while you're in that place. Now that may change as you go from place to place. So you're going to uh, make an adaptation, right? So as you're going from one place to another, it was like, okay, I need to respect the space that I'm in and what I can learn from the space, right? So that is going to be kind of the mindset and the philosophy that we have here at the school, right? And of course, it expounds after that, right? Okay, so we're like 36 minutes in, man, and I've been jibber-jabbering. So does anybody have any questions at this point? Well, I no do. No questions so far, not from the, the Facebook world. Okay, okay. I, I have a question. Fantastic. You, you but... spoke intensively about, um, you know, respect and talking and there's levels of what defense is. Um, I used to work in the, um, the criminal justice department, and the detention center department, and sure. I had to go uh, do a lot of things where I got involved in dangerous situations. And, you know, I'm, I'm five feet tall, so like yeah. everybody's taller than me. Um, but I, I, as you said, uh, you know, to go in, give people eye contact and show mutual respect. Um, hi, how are you? You know, good morning. Uh, and treat people as though they or, um, you know, just as respectful as you are, I found was the absolute best situation fixer at all times. Do you right. feel that, do you teach your students um that talking is is a very powerful tool and i like you said eye contact but a, a mutual self-respect is that where you start absolutely yes and that's why the the bow is there to show respect not only for yourself but the people around you but it is also um so so when i have students engaging i have them introduce themselves like Tell the person your name, who they are. Give some sort of life to yourself. You're not just a body in the room now. Now I understand, oh, this is a person. They have a name. What's your favorite thing or why are you here? So they have to introduce themselves. So they have to know the name and then tell them something about yourself, right? And I give them 45 seconds. So it's just like, you, you can't take a long time to think about this. I want you to know a name and I want you to know something about this person, right? That's important to them. Ask them why they're here or what their favorite thing is uh, about being here, right? Not your favorite color and things like that. Like that can be done at another time, but understanding why they're here. And that the reason I that's the specific question I have them ask is because now they understand what they have in common or another aspect of why other people might be doing the same thing that they're doing. So yes, I absolutely agree. It's like understanding people as being people just like you helps give a mutual respect that allows everybody to work together better. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I have another question. <laughs> Is that okay? Don't mind. Um, before we started, you had said that the actual uh, demonstration of Kung Fu is, is hard work. So, in relation to, um, like, say, for instance, jujitsu or judo, um, is and we've all seen Jackie Chan movies and right. kung fu movies where everybody's flipping in the air and kicking and all this right. other stuff. Um, is is this the gist of kung fu as opposed to um, more wrestling? Like, are you teaching quick? jabs to the throat <laughs> oh yeah we do that too um, <laughs> so, um, okay so I, I i think i know exactly what you want or what what you're asking so it's just like what is the difference of of this art versus other arts essentially okay so um the first thing i always promote is i don't i don't think one art is better than the other Right. I don't believe in that because at the end of the day, those people that are doing that are living off of what their predecessors did. They haven't done any of it, but their predecessors have amazing stories and they've pulled amazing feats and they've done all this. 
amazing stuff. Well, if my master were here, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And that's that's where we keep that. So what, when I look at that, what I mean by what are you doing is like, it's the practitioner. It's always going to be the practitioner. So when you're practicing an art, you embrace your art, practice your art. And why worry about another art unless it can add something to yours, right? So we look at different arts as, as being just different tools to accomplish the same thing to protect yourself, right? So when it comes to us versus, let's say Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, right? It's awesome and I love doing it, right? It's fun. I wrestled in high school, so I, it was like a fish to water for me. I was just like, ooh, I like this, right? So when it comes to doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu versus Kung Fu, like it's a lot about the like groundwork, right? And how do I get leverage on the ground, right? The philosophy is every fight goes to the ground. So how do I work from the ground, right? Now, the, the Kung Fu goes, fight may go anywhere. I have no idea, right? So if the fight may go anywhere, I need to know what to do at all levels. Now, the ground fighting in Kung Fu is a little different. So we have a stand-up, a wrestling, and a ground fight. And we also have not only large joint manipulation like they do in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but small joint manipulation that we do as well. So, excuse me, Kung Fu incorporates, it, it tries to incorporate a large scope of, of, of full defense, right? And then compared to like karate, like they both have all martial arts is based off circles and human anatomy, right? Basically, but they do a lot more, I guess, tighter and harder circles. Not to say they don't have their soft spots, spots too, uh, as far as how they use techniques, but you can see it's a lot harder, a lot stiff, right? Whereas Kung Fu focuses on more of the softer aspects and yielding aspects than what karate does. Now they both do it, they just do it in a different way. So it's different aspects. And if you go back and look at more traditional karate, you see the Kung Fu influence that it had as the Chinese masters left China and went to Korea and Japan and all these places, like that kind of seeped in, that martial arts seeped in. So you'll see an influence in there as well. So there's a little bit of it all in these martial arts. And that's why a lot of the time they, they call Chinese martial arts the grandparent of the martial arts, right? Now, that's not to say Korea and Japan didn't already have their own martial arts, but just Chinese martial arts came in and had a big influence on that as they took what was useful, right? So it was the same thing. I already got something, but I like what you're doing there. Let's see how we can use that. So when it comes to martial arts and their differences, the differences aren't that large in, if you think about root source, right, what it's all based on. The differences come in like nuances and what I want to focus and how I want to focus on it, right? So different people do it different ways. You'll even see this in Chinese martial arts. You'll have different lineages of the same martial art and they'll all look a little bit different. They'll all do moves maybe a little bit different. They're adhering to the same principles, but the way they go about doing it changes. And this is where the art part of the martial art comes from is this expression. Like I get to choose how I express these different things. So I think that would be the biggest thing is like the concentration, the concentration on how you apply principles and how you apply using your knowledge of anatomy of another person to defend yourself and stay safe. Uh oh, battery. You life. mentioned circling. circling. What is circling? Yeah. So circling is more of like uh, how you use your defense techniques. Like if you throw a punch, your punch isn't just straight. There's a circle that happens, right? When you defend, you don't just defend straight. There's a circle that happens, right? So usually when you're using self-defense, whether you're manipulating something, twisting it, right? Uh, there's circles that happen, right? So you can even do it as a complementary movement. A, a good, uh, everybody quotes, uh, Bruce Lee is um, like, uh, uh, be like water. And you're, you're completing a movement. So you're, if somebody comes in, you're not just going to stop it, right? You use that movement to initiate another movement, right? So I'll let that go by, but then I, I hit with the other side, right? Or I'm blocking this way, so I hit this way, right? Or I block this way and I hit this way. 
right? So there's a lot of different things that you can do using this idea of circling or spiraling. So that's what I mean by, by the circling. There's always this movement of circling. So we have a question on Facebook from a Michael Spanikos. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, it says, good afternoon, sir. I appreciate your video presentation. What style of Kung Fu do you teach and where is the school and what time do you teach? <laughs> awesome. So we, uh, we teach uh, praying mantis Kung Fu and we actually teach two different sects of praying mantis Kung Fu. There's Wallum. Uh, Kung Fu, uh, which has a lot of Southern influence to it. And then there's Seven Star Kung Fu. It's a uh, big Hong Kong style. Uh, Praying Mantis is about uh, between 450, 500 years old, right? And it's it's like, like 13 generations deep now. So um, when do we, or so where we're located is in the IGA Plaza on East Rancier. It's right up the street from uh, Killeen High School next to Long Branch Park. And the times I teach are multiple times in the evening on Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, best thing to do is, uh, uh, I think they'll put name and number up at some point or somewhere and just give us a call and I'll be able to help you out. We do a trial membership for everybody. This way we find out if it's a right fit for you. But thank you, yeah. Michael. I yeah, we're going to go ahead and put the, um, the link in our comments for them. Awesome. Thank you, ma'am. All right, so that was that was Michael. Fantastic, thank you, Michael. Is there anything else? Any other questions? Not yet. Okay. Okay. Um, I okay. I have a question again. I'm sorry. I'm all I'm full of questions. No, no um, when you uh were talking about knowing the room, uh, okay. I've taken self defense courses, just self defense. And one of the things they said is 90-90. Is okay. look 90, look 90, wherever you're walking, go this way, go that way. Is that what you mean by know the room? Or do you mean like study like different individual people? Sure, yeah, I'm a people watcher, so I like to study individual people. <laughs> but um, so big thing for me is just understanding the room, the size of the room and the exits. So I don't want to be paranoid about anything, but when I come into a room, it's just, okay, that 90, 90, that that's a good thing. Like, all right, those are the doors. Those are the exits. Fantastic. Now let me get a feel for what it's like in here. Like everybody seems to be vibing, having a good time. Awesome. It's like, and if something is out of place, like typically you'll notice that, right? So what will teach that to you from your martial arts training is body language, right? When you see like physical tension in people or the facial expressions on people, body language will tell you a lot about what's happening in a certain situation. So you're just aware of that thing that's happening. So even when I'm having conversations and I'm talking to a person, I'll take a moment to like just, all right, let me look around, see what's happening. And then I'm, I'm right back with the eye contact and making sure that I pay attention. All right, so it's it's just I I don't like to give the the mindset of paranoia like that's not what we're out there doing we're just paying attention and we're being aware that's the big thing so I got a scope for the room like I get a scope for the the people in the room and the body language that's going on in the room and that's how you kind of get a vibe for it and if there's different groups in the room you kind of just take a second to look at each group. And then you look at the body language of each group. Oh, everything's fine. And then all you got to do is every once in a while, take a scan. Like, what's changed? That's it. And it was like, oh, has, has body language changed? No, everybody's still having a fantastic time. Great. And I just don't get so buried in what I'm doing that something happened and I'm completely unaware of it. Right? So that's what I don't, I don't want to be surprised like that. But I also don't want to be paranoid in the places that I go. So it's nothing like paranoia. It's just taking that scan and paying attention to what's going on around you. That's it. Thank you. So in the art of um, Kung Fu, mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like in the martial arts themselves, because I've heard you speak before in different martial arts, um, it, it's not basically going to class to learn to kick somebody. 
and yeah. to flip over and you know do Jackie Chan moves. It's more of a philosophy, uh, a discipline, um, basically a way of life that is, um, in a way, it seems like giving you more control of your life. You know, getting rid of some of the fears and stuff. Is this more what it is like at your studio? Exactly, exactly, and that's what it is. So, and how I always explain that is uh, it's the path to self-mastery, right? And the path to self-mastery requires certain things. And so that's when we go into the life skills. This is what the path to self-mastery, mastering yourself. It's not just mastering martial arts. Right now, that's the tool that we use and the insurance that we're paying for through our physical and mental effort. And, and it should help us to master ourselves. So when I say it's the, it's the tool that we use. It's just, it's the modality that is teaching you how to master yourself. When I say it's the insurance that you have, it's you're learning how to defend yourself and how to use physical tools to, to combat, right? But hopefully I'm using all my other skills so I never end up in a situation like that unless it's a tournament type situation, right? Where I volunteered to go do this. So, if it's just insurance, just like your car insurance, you pay for it, hopefully we never have to use it, right? And if we do have to use it, hopefully it's good insurance, right? We wanna make sure we have a good policy. So we train hard and put everything we got into it to make sure we understand what we're doing. And then we test that, right? That's how we get into the uh, application training, the sparring training, things of that nature. So we do it in a safe, fun environment to where you go, oh, ooh, that was intense, but I know it's with people that actually care for me. They're not people that are actually trying to cause me physical harm, but we got to go through the motions and we got to kind of rough each other up a little bit from a loving perspective so that we know, okay, if I really had to use this and somebody was trying to rough me up that didn't care about me, I know that this stuff works, right? And I can use it. So I know firsthand, I got a good insurance policy. Why? I've tested it, right? So I've, I've been in a couple wrecks, <laughs> right? So you go through the process, right? But it's safe wreck, right? It's a controlled environment, so you don't have to worry about really getting injured. And that's my big thing. Might we get a bump, a bruise, or a scratch, or something like that, bloody lip, or something like that? Yeah, you might go through that, but those heal up quickly. What I don't want you to get is like broken bones or you know things of that nature. Where right, that that you, it's going to take you time to recover from this. It's not going to be easy. You're going to be out for six weeks to six months. I, I don't ever want that to happen, and it never has since I've been here. So, uh, and and we got a pretty good group. You know, that's it. All right, can I take well, this last? Go ahead. I just have one question, and then if if we have any other questions, you said that you you spoke about kids. How how young do you take them mm. at your studio? Yeah, four years old, four and up. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Janice, yep. any questions? Nope, I think that's it. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to take these last couple minutes to take everybody through uh, just a basic like warm-up series uh, that works out all of the, uh, I guess, major joints of the body and getting you to move. So we'll go through that. I'll go through it quickly. This will be recorded, so you'll be able to slow that down and go through it on your own. But I know we have limited time, so I want to make sure we get the most out of it. And I go through as much of the practice as I can. Usually it's like a 12 minute practice. Right. And I also want to do it before my battery dies because we got 10 percent. <laughs> all right. So how do I turn this video around? You see that? Can I flip this? Hmm. Stop video, switch camera, da 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 da. All right, Let's see if we can get this to do what I need it to do. Okay, so Miss Cindy, I just need you to tell me if you can see me. I, I see uh, from your waist down. Waist down, that's it? Yes. Okay, so let's do this. Let's scoot this way back here. And let's lift this up. How are we looking now? Yeah, I see you. Great. 
All the way down to the feet? Yes, I could see it through the glass table. Okay, awesome. Okay, so first thing that we're going to do is get our feet about shoulder width apart. Right? From there, we're going to interlock the fingers and we're going to rotate the wrist. We'll go forward and then we'll go backward, right? Obviously, this is to loosen up the wrist, get some blood and circulation going through that, and break up stagnation. Then we'll go to the ankles. We do one ankle at a time. We'll go clockwise and then we'll go counterclockwise. Then we'll do the other side, of course, clockwise then counterclockwise. Usually I do like a fast count of 10, or I do this for 15 seconds a piece. Then once I get those, I'm gonna put it together. So now we're gonna be working with the coordination. So I'm gonna rotate the wrist, and I'm going to make sure I do a clockwise circle. Then I'm gonna do it in reverse, all right? So the idea is to get that blood circulation and stagnation out of these extremity or joints in the extremity. So this is the furthest away from the heart, I want to get that stagnation broken up so I get blood flowing to those things, right? Then from there, I'm going to go to the neck. So what we do is stretch the neck in four different directions. I lift the chin, go to the ceiling. Then I tuck the chin and stretch the back of the neck. Then the left side, then the right side, and then I rinse and repeat. And again, I can hold each one of those for about 10 seconds, okay? And can I have to excuse me on some of these movements? I kind of pulled the muscle in the training today in my back. So it's following me, all right? Then from there, we do neck rotations. Then the other way. And then we do what's called eye training. So when I say eye training, what we're doing is we're focusing on a point. We turn the head quickly to focus on another point, come back, and then another point. But we do this as fast as we can. All right? Then we go to shoulder rotation. Right. I'm going to rotate the shoulders forward and back. Then with the arms, stretch backwards. Then the other side, do the same thing. Then we have arm rotations. So we go forward and we go back. Then we stretch the chest by opening up the rib cage. In the arms, forward and back. Open the chest, open the back. Then we turn the waist as far as we can. Right now, mine's not turning that far. Good. Then from side to side. So we stretch it as much as we get. We're just trying to get the spine to move here, right? And that's it. All right, so then we're going to have waist uh, rotations. So we get our feet almost shoulder width apart, and the idea is to rotate the waist all the way around to the front, and then we go back. Rotate, get that to turn. Rotate, get that to turn, right? That's it, right? Then we're going to have more waist training. The idea is to separate the feet about double shoulder width apart, inside the feet, outside the shoulders. And we want to stretch forward and press the ground and push the hips back. But then we're going to reach forward and twist from one side to the next. Then we want to stretch the lower back by lowering the upper body closer to the ground. And we go through three phases of this with the hands, with the forearms. And then with the elbow, trying to get closer each time. Now we intensify that by putting the feet together. Ankle grip strap. So the idea is to get the palms on the floor, then grab the calves, try and go further, and stretch as far as you can, holding the body in half. Right? Then from there, all we're gonna do is a inside hip stretch. To get the inside of that hip loosened up, then the other side. Then we're going to warm up the quads and also stretch the hip flexors by sinking down, back foot 45, hands on the hip, and sink down. Stretching that hip flexor, dropping your hip into your heel. 
All right, and of course, we'll do that on the other side. Sinking down, stretching. Okay. Then we go into the lower legs, all right? So all we're gonna do, keep your hands shoulder width apart. I'm going to drop all the way down to one side as far as I can with the feet flat. And I'm gonna drop my tailbone down and try and Now, the reason we pulse is gonna to be to help keep tightness in the muscles and not just totally stretch it out. And then it has to kind of regain some of its tension. We wanna keep tension in the muscle, but still loosen it up and bring heat to it. And that's the idea. And then we reach out, stretch a little more. Really loosen up. And then we go to the other side, of course, and do the same thing. Reach out, do the same thing. Stretch as hard as you can. Good. And then we go back, half split. So all I change is that one leg is up and this leg is bent. Then I'm going to reach out as far as I can. And then I'm going to switch. And I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm going to reach out, so I grab my foot, I reach past this other foot, right? And then I switch and I do the same thing. But then I go into the full splits. So I just keep this foot out, the other one in front of me. Try and straighten both legs out, then lower yourself down. One side, switch, you do the other side. And then you go down the middle, of course, stretching out as far as you can. Sinking down as much as you can. And then, of course, bring it back up, shake it out. Not sure how many of us can actually do a split like that, but I give it my best shot. Every <laughs> way to it. And so, one of the best ways you can do it is like taking a knee, put your foot on the side, and take a knee, and kick your other foot out, put your hands on the ground, and, and keep trying to work that forward. Don't go to one side. One hand on one side, one hand on the other, trying to keep the hips as square as you can, right? And then just keep keep working, keep working, keep working, keep working until you get it. It'll take a while, right? But you just go through it, okay? Then when you're through that, hip rotations both ways, knee rotations for us old people, right? And then what I do is a quad stretch, standing quad stretch, right? However long you want to do it. All right, and then we warm up. Then we go through our horse stand, straight kicks, outside presses, all the uh, all the larger, um, I guess, exercises that would help us with the style. Can we see a couple of those? A couple of all those exercises? Yeah, like a kick or a strike, or I'm just I'm curious. Do you have enough batteries? <laughs> Do you have enough time? Battery life. <laughs> So um, I'm not even gonna look at it. So we'll just go through it. And if, if I lose you guys, right. <laughs> so um, let's go through a basic I might teach students, um, which would be eight basic methods of punching. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you like the first five because it changes direction. So I'll just show you the first five. So when we start for a wall on basics, Stable position, King Joy, Quad Joy, Chow Joy, Bean Joy, and then King Joy, right? Which would be a circular punch, right? So when I'm doing this straight punch, downward energy with this punch, upward energy with this punch, sideways energy with this punch, right? So I'm working like the different angles that I can use punches. And these aren't all punches, these are just some basic punches a person would use. Right. Um, in seven star, we would use that first punch and what we would call like uh, supplementary punches. So if we block to one side, right, that punch would be straightforward. Right. I use this hand to block and stay guarded, and then I would come back defensive posture. Right. So I'm going through a series of offense, defense, offense, defense. So I want to defend. So what we do is purely self defense as as it pertains to like seven star praying mantis. So all of our movements are predicated off the of defense first. Like somebody has attacked me, I'm using a defensive movement to return that energy to me. All right. Well, that was great. 
Um, thank you. And while you were doing this, you had a little photo bomber in the back behind you. Oh, my son. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah. But um, Sifu Sifu Henderson, thank you so much, and um, thank you for demonstrating and telling us about kung fu. Um, Guys, this is where you go to get a lot of your information. You've got a great demonstration of what uh, the martial art is. Um, we've, like I said, we've worked with uh, Sifu Henderson for quite some time now, about two years, and um, he's very, very enlightening. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but. Thank you. Check out his website, and uh, if you have any questions, can they go ahead and contact you through your website? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you can also uh, look us up if you have any questions on Marshall Zen Colleen on Facebook. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time this morning, to, well, today, this afternoon, to yeah. um, meet with us. Uh, we really, truly appreciate it. It's always fun to have you come and talk to Central Texas College and all of our community and our global students. So, um, it's everywhere. Always. Thank you, Ms. Oso. I appreciate you having me. It's always fun doing this with you guys. So, uh, anytime you guys are ready, let me know. We will. We will. So now I tomorrow. I just wanted to uh, report the poll. Uh, I put a poll up about which technique people were interested in. We had two people weigh in. They were interested in Kung Fu and Taekwondo. I'm going to uh, let the poll go for a little while and see if we get any more um, particip participants or submissions. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Fantastic. And then oh. tomorrow, make sure that you um, come back tomorrow at noon for. Um, Absolute Self Defense Academy in Coppers Cove. They're going to be doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And then we have Taekwondo from Legacy Martial Arts in Hawker Heights on Thursday. So we have a lot of martial arts for you guys this week. Um, make sure you join us again. Thank you. And um, you guys have an awesome day today. Uh, stay out of the heat. We went from stay warm to stay cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's Texas weather, but the good news is in this in the fall we do have a meteorologist that's going to tell us why Texas has crazy weather. So, oh, awesome. so make sure that you keep up with our virtual events. Thank you yeah. again. Uh, we're going to be signing out, but don't go anywhere. Sifu Henderson, stay with us. Okay. Bye, guys. Have a good day. Bye.